Hi, this is Tracy with KOGmissions.com and welcome to Simple Bible Truth. I hope to encourage you in your faith and inspire you to seek truth, to love God, and to obey Jesus. Today we're going to be talking about giving and tithing. And do you think that Christians are required to tithe? Are we required to give a tenth of everything we make to the church or to God in some way? We're going to take a look at that today and see what the Bible has to say about tithing and about giving. Tithing was actually an Old Testament command and it was required under the law. But what I found when I was doing a little research was quite interesting. People were not required to tithe on everything. And in fact, not all people were required to tithe. It was actually just the farmers. The people that were working the land, the grain, uh, the fruit trees, and the animals or flocks, they were required to tithe. And the tithe went to the tabernacle. And the purpose of well, the tithe and a lot of the offerings that were brought to the tabernacle or to the priest was so that the priests could be cared for because they didn't work another job and they did not have any inheritance in the land or what God had given to the rest of the Israelites. And so they were cared for in that way. So as I mentioned, I found that say a metal worker or somebody that worked with textiles or a fisherman, they were not required to give a tenth of what they earned. You know, a fisherman did not bring a tenth of his fish to the tabernacle and donate it. But the farmers were required to do that. Now, in saying that, people still all brought offerings to the tabernacle. And so they were all required to give in some way, but they were not all required to tithe. Something else I found that was interesting that I really hadn't noticed before that there are three different tithes. So there was the tithe on the land and the herds and the flocks, but there was also a festival tithe. And that was to be brought in in order to provide for all the different festival things that they needed to do for those special times that they were required to keep. Also, there was a charity tithe. And this was actually every three years, I believe, and that went towards widows, the fatherless, uh, even the Levites, strangers in the land. It went to help take care of people. So it was a humanitarian type of tithe. In Leviticus 27.30, it talks about robbing God. And the idea was because God owns everything. It's all his to begin with. And if you're not giving him what is his, it's considered robbing him. So how does that play out in the New Testament? As Christians and believers, we should recognize that everything we have is God's and he's given it to us. So whether you go to work and you earn money and you say, well, I, I made this, I did that, it's still God's and he's still providing for you. So what are you supposed to do with your giving? How do you give to God? Something else that is interesting to consider was in regards to the animals and the flocks, it says that every tenth one that would pass under the rod was to be given to God and to the, you know, the tabernacle, to the service. It was the tithe. Well, if you had nine sheep, you don't tithe a tenth on those nine sheep. You only would tithe the tenth one or the same with your flocks and things like that. And so it wasn't 10% on everything. It was the tenth of the animals. So I thought that was pretty interesting too. Now in the New Testament, we do not see that Christians were required to tithe, but we still see that they're required to give to the people that are ministering to them, the pastors and teachers, those who are preaching and teaching. It says that they should receive for the work that they do. And so there should be giving towards that. It talks about giving to the poor and the orphans and the widows and caring for your brothers and sisters as well, if you see a need. And so we have that same sort of giving in the New Testament, but what is really interesting, it is more about 
the generosity and giving generously that we know that God has provided and meets our needs and he will continue to do that. And so when we see there's a need, we give to it. It's important to remember as Christians and looking at the New Testament believers that we are not under the law of Moses. We are actually under the law of Messiah and that's under the law of grace. And so that does not take away the need to give but it opens a whole new way of giving. So the question is, if Christians are not under the law and required to tithe, what are they required to do and how are they supposed to give? Well, if we look at the New Testament, we see the teaching of Jesus and the disciples that when you become a Christian, it is total self-sacrifice. We are told to put our lives on the altar, basically. We need to be willing to give up ourselves and our desires to follow Christ. He said the road is narrow, and he says that we need to be willing to take up the cross and follow him and sacrifice everything that we have. Now, does that mean he wants us to give everything up and take all your money and give it all to the poor? No, that's not what it means. But we do need to be willing to put what we own and what we have on the altar and say, I know it's yours, what do you want me to do with it? In James, we see that faith without works is dead. And so if we say we have faith, which is what Christians uh, live by is faith, we need to have works along with that faith. They go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. In Galatians, it tells us that if we have the opportunity to do good and to give to people, and meet needs, we should do it. So if you have the opportunity to do it, consider it a blessing and help meet those needs and give to those needs. In 2 Corinthians 9, it talks about giving in a way that will bless you as well. It says if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. And it also says that God loves a cheerful giver. We shouldn't be giving grudgingly or out of compulsion. We need to be giving because we desire to do that. And we're excited to see how God is going to continue meeting the needs that we have because we're being generous with what he's already given us. So when you're giving and when you're donating to different things, where's your heart at? Are you finding joy in that? And are you doing it cheerfully? And thinking of all the ways that you are blessing your brethren or ministry that is going on. If we give generously and if we give as God directs us and leads us in our spirit, it says that we will be sufficient in what we need. We will have sufficiency and God will meet our needs. And in fact, Jesus told us, in Matthew 6, 33, that if we seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness, all of our material needs will be met. It doesn't tell us that we'll have abundance in everything or riches, but it does tell us that our needs will be met and we have that guarantee and we can know that they will. And in addition to that, we can know that if God motivates us in our spirit to give to somebody or something, he will provide for us and he will meet the needs that we have as well. And he uses fellow believers, as we see in Acts, they all brought their money and their things together to share. And it says nobody lacked anything. Those who had little didn't lack and those who had a lot didn't lack. Nobody had too much or too little. And if we're looking at following Christ and living as that first century church, then we should be looking to help one another out and to help meet the needs of our brothers and sisters around us, whether it's local in a local church that meets together or globally around the world. When we see that there are needs that our brothers and sisters have, we should trust that God will help us to meet those needs because he wants the needs of the church met. When we choose to give, we are showing God that we trust him, that we trust that he will meet our needs and he will continue to provide for us as well. And it also tells us that we know that everything is his anyways. 
that we aren't holding on to it as ours or thinking that we have some right to it because everything we have truly did come from God. Just like Jacob said in the Old Testament, he said, everything I have is yours, God, and I'm going to give a tenth of it to you. That's what he chose to do. It wasn't because the law told him to give a tenth. It's because of his grateful heart and because he acknowledged that everything he had did come from God, and he wanted to give back to God as well. God doesn't need our money. God doesn't need our things. He can find a way to meet the needs that his people have and the ministry that is being done on his behalf and the kingdom that's being preached. He can find a way to have that done. He doesn't need your money. But it's to our benefit when we provide it and we take part in this because then we are blessed as well. And it tells us that it is God who provides the seed for us to sow. So even though we're sowing, the seed comes from him. And we should acknowledge that and be thankful for it and be ready to give when he asks us to give. As Christians and followers of Jesus, we should not be sitting counting pennies What's one-tenth of what I made? And do I count it from gross or do I count it from net? We should be looking that we have what we have and it's all God's. And we should ask him, how much do you want me to give? Where do you want me to give it to? If you are attending a church group and you have people that are teaching and preaching, pastors, teachers, you should be giving and donating to them so that they can continue to serve you and to serve God in those ways. That is biblical. It tells us in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, that the elders who rule well should be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So clearly those people who are serving on the front lines, serving the brothers and sisters and doing the evangelism and mission work and things like that, those people should be compensated for the work that they do so that they are able to do that work. We are also told that we need to be careful because even though money is not evil in and of itself, it can be the root to evil. But we are also warned not to let wealth become our idol. We should not let money and things come in place of trusting God, that we trust in that money, we trust in the bank account or the savings account and have peace because we know we'll be taken care of if something happens. We need to have that peace in God, not because we have money in the bank. Galatians 3 is a fantastic chapter to look at when we are considering faith and the law and giving and tithing because Galatians 3.13 says that Christ redeemed us out from under the curse of the law. So we are no longer under that law. And 6.23 says that um, he testifies that before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. And the law is said to have been a tutor, and that when faith came, we were no longer in need of a tutor. So it was there for a while for a purpose, but it is no longer there as a requirement for us. So simply put, Christians need to surrender their entire life to Jesus. They need to be willing to follow him, to take up their cross, and give their entire life, everything they are and everything they have, to follow him. And following him not only means serving and doing the work he told us to do, but also serving and caring for our brothers and sisters, as we saw the first century church do. And when they did that, it grew in explosive ways. God has entrusted us with everything we have. And it's like the parable where Jesus said that he gave the servants some money and told them to be busy with it while he went away. And when he comes back, he's going to see what you did with what he gave you. So if you have a lot, he's going to require a lot of you. 
If you had little, he's going to require less of you, but it doesn't matter what you've been given, a little or a lot. You are required to work with what you have and invest that in his kingdom work and in caring for his people. When we understand this and we embrace it, we are going to experience wonderful uh, peace and great joy. Giving really is a joy. And as Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And once you practice that sacrificial giving, you will know what he means by that. Because if we look at the widow who gave a sacrifice because she didn't have and she gave the last of what she had, it cost her something. That was amazing. And he saw that as a greater act of giving than the rich people who just gave out of their abundance. It didn't cost them anything. And it didn't even hurt them. They just gave because they had extra. And we look at David, he said he was not going to give anything that didn't cost him something. So when we give, we shouldn't be looking at just giving when we have extra. Or we should be asking God at the beginning, what do you want me to give to? And obviously, if you have bills and responsibilities, he wants you to pay those and to take care of those things. But we should also be thinking how he wants us to spend our money and our time in terms of ministry and taking care of our brothers and sisters. The best thing for a Christian to do is to teach and to follow and practice the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. Not the law that bound people to tithing, but to the law of the Spirit that says give generously. That what you sow is what you will reap. So we have a choice. Do we want to reap a lot? Then you better be sowing more. So if you sow a little, you reap a little. If you sow a lot, you will reap a lot. How many seeds are you planting? Are you planting one seed? Because if you plant only one seed, you're not going to get as big a harvest if you scatter a whole bunch of seed out there. And you will get many, many more plants in return if you plant a lot of seed. And that is the same thing when we look at finances or other things that God has given us. If we are teaching tithing, we're losing the opportunity to be abundant givers. If all we hope for is 10%, you probably won't even get that. God is a big God and he owns everything and he wants his people cared for. He wants his work done and he knows what it needs to take to get it done. And if we trust him and if we want to be a part of what he's doing, we need to invest our time and our money. And when we do, we will be blessed abundantly. It'll, we will be blessed richly. We will not even imagine what kind of blessing can come until we start pouring out sacrificial giving, giving generously, and listening to what God has to say about how much to give and where to give. As the church, we should not focus on the Old Testament law of tithing. We should be focusing on the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. And when we do that, God's work will be funded, God's people will be cared for, and our faith will grow. We will be in an amazing position. We will be reaping so many good things. And we will have joy that we cannot even imagine. Because when we give cheerfully, we receive back so much more. And it is a, a rich blessing to be able to give to God's work and to God's people. I encourage you to continue to seek truth. Seek truth about tithing and giving. Ask God what he wants you to do. To love God and to obey Jesus. And when you do that, you will have an abundant life. Not necessarily things and money. But you will have an abundant life in peace, in the shalom peace that God desires for you to have. And you will have an abundant life in the future when Jesus returns and says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You used what I gave you for the work that I intended and to care for your brothers and sisters. 
we will receive much more in the age to come than we can even imagine giving in this age. So give generously and with joy and from a cheerful heart. God bless.